If you got your Bibles this morning, turn to Mark chapter 6, and we've been talking about even greater, that I believe God has even greater in store for us than, than anything that we've seen yet. Amen. And what did, what did he say? What did Jesus say in John 14, verse 12? You'll do the same things that I did, that I'm doing, but even greater. Okay, so I'm believing for, and I believe we're coming into a season now of even greater, that he's got more in store for us, amen? And so we've been, if you're keeping track, if you've been, if you've been paying attention, we've been walking through the book of John, because John points out some different signs that Jesus did, proving that he was the Messiah. And so what we've been saying is, if Jesus said we're supposed to do what he did, and even greater, then we should look at what Jesus had been doing. And so I'm going to look at Mark chapter 6, though, because it brings up some different things. But um, there's a story here, and I'm going to call it a ghost story. 
There's kind of a ghost, you know, there's a ghost story in the Bible, and this is the ghost story. And, you know, ghost stories, if you ever sat around a campfire when you were a kid or something, and somebody told you one of those ghost stories, and, and maybe if you were young enough, what happened when you went to bed that night, you were, you know, your eyes were wide open looking at the shadows. Why? Because the, the ghost story is meant to do something. It's meant to incite fear inside you, isn't it? That's why you can, you can read a book, you can watch a movie, and you, know, you jump and there goes your popcorn when something scary happens. You're in no danger, but it feels like you are because fear is kind of this contagious thing. Um, you know, a few years ago, when my boys were young, I took them to the zoo and they used to have this thing, this movie theater that was there that I think they called it like a 4D theater or something, right? And so we took them in there and it was a 4D which means they do extra things. They'll throw things at you or something. And it was of dinosaurs. And I thought, oh, won't that be nice? The boys like dinosaurs. And I took them in there, and it scared the living daylights out of them. And they, were, they were little, and they were screaming, and they were crying. I had to carry them out of here. I, I paid money for this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, carried, I carried them out of that thing, screaming and crying. They were terrified. They were in no danger. There, was, there were no real dinosaurs in that place, but they were convinced they were. They thought they were going to get eaten by a velociraptor. But there was nothing in there to scare them, but they picked up on somebody else's fear. They're watching somebody on the screen get scared. So what happened? They got scared too. And in, in my house, the scariest thing is when one of the kids sees a spider in, in their bedroom because you know nobody's going to sleep. It's, they're all going to hear about it. They tell each other, there was a spider. I saw a spider. In fact, one of them the other day, they found one near their bed. They said, Dad, there's a huge spider next to my bed, and I had to go up there and kill it. I, I could not see it. I promise you. I said, I need to get my glasses to see this spider. Where is it? It's right there. I, okay, it's gone now. It's gone now. But I know it's scary because the other ones don't even have to see it. All they got to do is hear about it, and they're they're going to be scared. They don't want to go to the room because there's spiders that live up there and I'm not going anywhere near the spiders. Do you know what I mean? So what's happening is we're picking up on other people's fear. Fear is contagious. And listen to me, fear is an enemy. Fear is a faith killer. And fear is your enemy. Listen, you pick up on fear the same way you pick up on faith. They both come by hearing. They both come by hearing. So I want to talk to you this morning about this ghost story, and I want you to see how fear can keep you from moving in what God's called you to. See how fear can keep you from becoming what God's called you to be. Uh, listen, fear will keep you out of faith. So in Mark chapter 6, Look at verse 45, and we're going to start there. It's the story of Jesus walking on the water. So Mark 6, 45, it says, immediately, this is right after Jesus had just fed the 5,000. If you remember from the last time I preached, that was the last thing. So it says immediately after he fed 5,000 people, immediately after they had this miracle where bread and fish multiplied in their hands, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. Say made. You know, you could, he, he made them do it. Okay, catch that. Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he said goodbye, he went to the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. And now listen to this. He saw them being battered as they rode, rode because the wind was against them. So here, I want you to catch this now. So Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and he put them in a situation where it was going to be tough. In fact, it says they were, he saw them being battered. So listen, the, the word batter here in the King James, it says toiling. They saw them toiling against the waves, 
against the wind. So toiling is working and working, but not getting ahead. But it's really even worse than that because in the original language, what it says is tormented. They're being tormented. They're being tortured. They're in pain. So imagine that Jesus sent them into a situation where they're going to be tormented, where they're going to be tortured, and where they're going to be in pain. Toiling and toiling and not getting ahead. That's not how Jesus described life with him, right? I've come that you can have life and have it how? More abundant. But here they are in a situation that Jesus sent them into, and it's not, it's not life more abundant. It's toil. Remember when Jesus met Peter and he said, take your boat and go launch out into the deep and cast your net out for a catch of fish. And he, and he catches so many fish, what happens? The net starts to break and the boat starts to sink when they get, finally get all the fish on the boat. And Jesus uses that as an illustration. He's like, you're gonna, you're, he says, you're going to be catching men like this. Your life now from now on is going to be like this. It's going to be full. It's going to be abundant life. And here they are toiling. Jesus sent them into toil. Listen, does it ever seem like God has sent you into a tough time? You're going through something. He said, God, what in the world am I going through here? Why am I facing this? What did I do to deserve this, right? Lord, what did I do? To, I, the disciples could have asked that. Jesus, what did we do to deserve this? This toil, what, what, why are you tormenting us? Because it feels like that. We blame everything on God. So here's what Jesus, now listen, again, Jesus just fed 5,000 people with some loaves and some fish. And the miracle took place in the hands of the disciples, right? They're passing it out and passing it out. They're seeing this thing in front of their eyes their faith level should have been, I mean, can you get any higher? It should have been a 10 out of 10 or a 12 out of 10, something like that. Their faith level shouldn't have been able to get any higher. So Jesus immediately takes them from this place where they should have been in faith and puts them in a situation now where they're facing toil, they're facing torment, they're facing a situation where they should be using what they've been learning. We talked about last time, the faith test. Okay, you've been learning, now put it into practice because if it doesn't get put into practice, it's no good for you. If you just come and sit in church and hear about faith and you leave and you don't use it, it's not any good for you. It's meant to be used. Amen. But see, the disciples left that supernatural event unchanged. They still had the same old natural man centered, low life thinking. It didn't, it didn't get in here. It didn't get in here what they had just seen. But Jesus was expecting them to start having some faith, to start using some faith, to start handling the situations when they came up. See, listen, I believe God will let you get into situations where you need to use your faith. But too many times we act like the disciples, don't we? And we get right back into that same old natural way of thinking and living. And instead of handling the situation with faith, we say, God, why are you doing this to me? God, what did I do? Why? And he's saying, why don't you just use what I've given you? Come on, I've given you everything you need to handle this situation. But here we are whining and complaining, right? Instead of facing the situation with faith. See, there's, there's Christians today that are being battered. There's Christians today that are being tormented and tortured by things that they are supposed to be dominating. You were, listen, you were not put on this earth to be tormented. You were put on this earth to dominate. Jesus, come on, he lives inside you by his Holy Spirit and he gave you his Holy Spirit to dominate the world. This is the victory that's conquered the world, even our, one person knew it, even our faith. That's the victory that conquers the world, your faith. Come on. I know it's rainy outside. Are you awake still? 
Make, check the person next to you. Do, we'll do a wake-up check every few minutes. Listen, God didn't send the wind. Jesus didn't send the wind. He didn't send the waves. But he knew it was coming, and he sent the disciples. Come on. He'd been equipping them to handle it. He didn't send sickness to you. He didn't send financial hardship to you. He didn't send struggles with your relationships, with your marriage, with your family. He didn't send all the problems that are plaguing this world, but he did send you to use your faith and do something about it. Amen. But most of the church sits by and lets life happen to them because, why? Because we, sit, we think it's just natural. It's just natural for these things to happen. It's, waves and wind are just natural. We're just going to struggle and struggle and str eventually we'll reach the other side. I don't know if you've ever been in a boat paddling against the, the current, against the waves, against the wind. I remember my uncle used to have an old fiberglass boat. It was heavy. It was a heavy boat. And me and my cousin were little and we, we would take that thing out sometimes, but it was a little unpredictable and the engine quit running one day. And there we are, we're probably a mile from the house and we start getting out those paddles and we're just paddling and paddling, but the current's taking us out into the Chesapeake Bay. And we're just paddling and paddling, and we're, our, our eyes are getting bigger. We're not gonna make it, because we're just getting, every time we paddled, we were getting further away. And we, I remember struggling and struggling and struggling and thinking we weren't gonna make it. And that's how a lot of people go through life. Life feels like it's just pushing me. I'm doing everything I can to try to keep my head, and I'm just getting pushed backwards. There's nothing I can, that's not how you're supposed to live. The Bible didn't say greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world for no reason. Come on. The problems and frustrations in this world are natural, but the natural must bow to the supernatural. The natural, listen to this, the natural, everything you can see in this world, everything you can touch in this world was made from the supernatural. It was made from faith. God spoke it into existence by faith. Everything you see came from things you can't see. And so that means everything you can see has to bow its knee to faith. When you put your faith to work, the natural has to bow. So look, keep looking at this story with me. So here's Jesus. And he sees them in verse 48. Throw that up there for me again. In verse 48, it says, he saw them being battered as they rode because the wind was against them. I want you to understand this. Here's Jesus still on the shore. They're miles, maybe a mile, maybe two miles out in the dark. But Jesus can see them. How can he see them? It's supernatural, isn't it? You can't see at night out in the middle of a lake. If they, could, if they could have seen, if he could have seen them naturally, then they could have seen him and not been surprised when he came walking on the water. But they couldn't see because it was dark. But Jesus could see them. He could see them being battered. He could see the pain they were in. He could see their struggle. And I, I think this is really comforting. Because no matter what you're facing in this life, he sees you. He sees you. He can see what you're going through. He can see what you're facing. He can see the things that have come against you. He's the God who sees. He knows what you, listen, if you've been dealing with something, he knows what you've been dealing with. He knows the situation, the problem. He knows everything about it because he's the God who sees. Someone's out there. Maybe you're watching today. You're facing something. You're wondering, where is God? Where was Jesus in that situation with the disciples? Oh, where, where was he? He was there. He was watching them. He could see what they were going through. He, but he had prepared them for the struggle. We wonder, why didn't he just run out? Why didn't he come running and just rescue them? Because he would already prepared them for the battle. 
He's given you what you need, church. He's already, listen, Jesus said, it is finished. He took care of everything. He gave you everything you need. You just got to start facing it with some faith. Because look what Jesus was going to do. Put that up again, verse 48. Where's the next verse? 49. Wherever it is. I have it here. Around three in the morning, he came walking toward them, walking on the sea, and he wanted to pass them by. He wanted to pass them by. So, Jesus, what's wrong with you? Your disciples are struggling. You came out walking on the sea, and you've seen them struggling. You've seen the torture, their pain they're in. They've been rowing all night long. The wind's just pushing them backward, pushing them backward. And he wants to pass them by. Why? Because he was going to the other side. He was walking, listen, he was walking on top of the thing that they were struggling with. They're struggling and striving and not getting ahead and getting beaten and getting tortured. And there he is out for a stroll on top of the very thing they were struggling with. I don't know if you ever tried to walk on, you know, one of those kinds of things that are real wobbly and real, you know, some kind of a shaky bridge or something, or a, uh, we got our, one of our kids, what do they call that? A slack line. And we put it between the trees and it's, I, my knees get shaken so bad. I can hardly, I can't stay on that thing. I don't know if you've tried to walk on something like that, that's moving and you can't quite keep your balance and it's so hard, but here's Jesus. Those things that are coming up and down, they're not affecting him at all. He's, I bet he's not even wet. He's just walking on top of the thing that they've been struggling with. Being tortured by, listen, faith is what put him on top of the world. His faith, this is the victory that's conquered the world. Our faith. But his, his poor disciples are struggling and being tortured, they're in pain, but Jesus is on top of the world. So listen, who are you supposed to be living like? The disciples. You're supposed to be living like Jesus. You're supposed to be doing the things that he did, but even greater. So the disciples are living in the natural, but Jesus is living in the supernatural where there's no toil, there's no struggle. He's just out for a stroll. So Jesus is about to pass by. He's not doing anything to help because he already did. He already gave them faith. He already showed them what could happen if you believe God. Listen, Elijah was a man who didn't have Jesus standing right next to him, and he prayed some pretty amazing prayers and got some answers. And here's the disciples. They've just seen fish multiply in their hands, and they don't have the faith to get them to the other side. At some point, you want your kids to start doing stuff for themselves. You know, you start small, right? Let me, let me help you get dressed. Hey, can you think you can put your pants on yourself today? Why don't you try? You know, hey, you want to use the toilet? Great. Why don't you take care of that business? Let me know how it goes. You know, <laughs> you start small. Let me tie your shoes for you. Here's how you do it. We've been struggling with some of this. Let me tie your shoes. If I'm still tying shoes when my kids are in college, I've failed. I don't want to be doing that. They shouldn't want me to be doing that for them. So here's Jesus. He's trying to start these guys off small. You're going to go through some junk in life. You better learn how to handle it. That's what he's telling them. Stuff's going to come against you. You better learn how to handle it. I'm going to the other side. I don't know about you guys, right? So he wants them to use their faith. Now, here's the ghost story. Look at verse 49. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. They saw Jesus 
and they thought he was a ghost. Look, look, notice this. Their torment turned to fear. Torment, if you don't deal with it by faith, will always turn to fear. If you don't stand in faith in the middle of your situation, fear is going to come in. Because when you're in pain, being tortured with a problem without faith, your mind will start playing all kinds of scenarios for you, doesn't it? Oh, what about this? I bet this could happen. Hey, it, thank you, mind. I appreciate that. Thank you for bringing all that to my attention. I didn't know that could happen. And fear just sets in. And one, See, listen, uh, look at 2 Timothy 1.7. We open the service with this. For God's not given us a spirit of, this says fearfulness, but it's fear. In the King James, God's not given us a spirit of fear. Did you know spear is a uh, spear? Fear is a spirit. Fear is a spirit. It's a demonic spirit that wants to come and just overwhelm you because fear, listen, the way fear works, once fear comes in just a little bit, if you let it, it starts to grow and it starts to control you. It's, you start to do things based on what that spirit of fear is telling you. Keep that verse up there for me. God's not given you that spirit of fear, but he's given you the spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. He's given you everything you need to defeat fear. Listen, he gave, you, he gave you a spirit of power. That means you've got power over the enemy. You've got his authority over the enemy. The enemy can't stop you. So you've got no reason to fear the enemy. You're walking in the love of God. The love of God is being shed abroad in your heart and where love is, where perfect love is, it doesn't just tolerate fear. It doesn't just ask fear to please go away. It drives out fear. Perfect love, the perfect love of God will go after fear like a, like a rancher will go after cattle and drive it. He'll just drive that thing. The love of God will drive it far away from you when you're walking in love. And then listen to this is the most important part. And he gave you a sound mind. Who you, you got a sound mind. Sometimes you might think you don't. You might, you might think you feel a little crazy. You feel like stuff's coming again. No, no, no. You got, you've got a sound mind. Maybe you can put it up with kids all day long and you feel like, you feel like there's nothing left in here and you're just... Uh, crazy. No, no, no. You've got, you've got a sound mind. Fear can't come into a sound mind because the fear will try to come in and bring those scenarios and say, Hey, what about this? And what about that? No, no, no. My mind is at peace. My mind is at rest because my God has taken care of me and he's taking care of whatever I'm facing. And I'm doing what Jesus said. I'm taking no thought for my life. I'm taking no worry, no concern for my life. So you've not been given a spirit of fear. You've been given the spirit that dominates fear. You've been given a spirit that can control your mind. Because listen to me, church, when you got born again, that was your spirit. Your spirit got born again. That man inside of you, the inner man was born again. That's, that's your connection to God. But your mind has to be renewed. You've got to start thinking like God thinks. You've got to take control of this mind because it will always want to run back to the natural. It will always want to run back to its old way of thinking, old way of doing things. It will try to tell you how to live. Listen to me. You don't listen to what that thing says. You listen to what the Spirit of God says. You're not controlled by your mind, your intellect, your emotions. You're controlled by the Spirit of God. And so when the mind says, you better be afraid, you better worry, you better do this. No, no, no. I'm controlled by the spirit of God. Amen. Amen. But you got to let faith dominate you. Come on. So here's Jesus walking on the water and they think he's a ghost. Isn't that something? How often does God show up and people don't recognize him? You ever had a miracle? Maybe, you, maybe somebody's had a miracle and they wrote it off as coincidence. 
oh, I guess that just, that thing just went away, or that just, oh, isn't that nice how that worked out? They didn't even recognize God showed up. How many times has God spoken to somebody and people didn't recognize it? In fact, I, this, this particular verse speaks to me so much. John chapter 12, can you put that up there? Verse 27. Jesus says, my, my soul's troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that's why I came to this hour. Look what he says. Go to 28. Father, glorify your name. And then God spoke. A voice came from heaven. I've glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. God spoke, and people didn't recognize it. Listen, God spoke audible words, and people said, oh, do you guys hear that thunder? Other people said, no, that was, hey, I heard an angel. The angel spoke. They didn't recognize God when he spoke. How many times has God shown up? How many times has God spoken to his people and his people didn't recognize it? I read an article the other day. A guy said, the Lord spoke to him. He said, I want you to build a Christian TV network. He said, okay, okay, God, I, I'll, if you're telling me to do that, I'll do that. He, God said, now listen, I want you to know you're not my first choice. <laughs> he said, oh, Really? Oh, really? Well, Lord, if you don't mind me asking, what number was I? He said, you were seven, the seventh choice. You, if, now, listen, that means there were six other people who either didn't hear God or said no. Well, that bothers me. How many times has God spoken to us? How many times has God shown up in our lives and we're just not even aware of it? So here's Jesus showing up for the disciples and they think it's a ghost. There's been times Christians have found themselves in storms. Listen, and God's told them what to do in his word, but they didn't hear what he had to say. They're listening to other people's opinions. Out on that lake in the middle of the night, the disciples hadn't learned what they should have learned or they wouldn't have been scared. They didn't understand who Jesus was. I wonder why they thought he was a ghost. I bet there was ghost stories back then like there is now. Hey, be careful if you're ever out on the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the night. You be careful because I heard there was a guy. He, he saw some ghosts out there one night. They're, they'll come get you and they'll drag you to the bottom of the water. And they're going to, you know what I mean? They tell these stories. And the disciples listen to the stories more than they listen to Jesus. They believe the stories instead of believing Jesus. People, church, Christians are listening to ghost stories more than they're listening to the Holy Ghost. They listen to fear instead of the word of God that says, don't be afraid. We gotta stop listening to ghost stories, come on. Some people still believe the ghost stories over what the word says. Hey, you know, people say, be careful about this or that. Be careful about that. Hey, if you ever get that disease, there's no hope for you. That's a ghost story. Don't you believe it? You ever lose that job, you're not going to make it. No, don't, don't you listen to the ghost stories. Don't you believe that stuff? Hey, I, I had somebody tell me one day, he said, he said, my kids, talking about his kids, he said, my kids were rebellious growing up. They were just doing wild stuff. He said, don't you think your kids are going to be any different just because you're, just because you, you think you're whatever, a preacher or you, you're a Christian or something like that. That's, hey, listen, that's a ghost story. I'm not going to listen to you because I have the word of God that tells me if I train a child in the way they should go, when they're old, they won't depart from it. I read a Christian article about that and it said, well, that's not really a, promise that's just more of a principle because we can't really, you know, predict what people are going to do in this. I've got, no, you can believe that if you want to. I'll believe the word of God because that's what the word of God says. It's not a principle. It's a promise. And I'm standing on the word of God for my children. I'm standing upon the word of God for my life. You can believe what you want to believe. You can believe the ghost stories if you want to, but I choose to believe the word of God 
Don't you give in to the spirit of fear because as soon as you give in to that, well, maybe that won't work for me. Maybe that word's just a principle that doesn't really work and have any effect in my life. You're gonna start to let fear come in. And you'll be like, Job, I wonder what my kids have done today. I wonder if they have offended God today. I better go make some sacrifices. I better do something to make sure I protect them. And then disaster comes because you let fear come into your life. Don't you let it. So Jesus is walking right past the disciples and they're afraid of ghosts. Listen, the one who could help them, the one who created the universe with a word is walking past them and they're crying like little babies because they're scared. Listen, fear is a faith killer. It's what it wants to do. Fear wants to destroy your faith. But immediately, listen to what Jesus said. Immediately he talked with them and he said, take heart. This is in the King James. Take heart, I am. Maybe that wasn't King James. I can't remember. Maybe Amplified, something like that. Take heart, I am. Stop being alarmed and afraid. He says, don't be afraid. I am is here. You remember the I am when God showed up with Moses and Moses says, who who should I say is sending me to the Israelites? What did he say? I am, tell him I am is here. I am has come to rescue you. I am has come to set you free. The great I am has come and you don't have to worry about anything anymore. So Jesus shows up and he says, hey, I am is here. Don't worry about anything. Don't be afraid about anything because I am is here. Listen, I am is with you. The the great I am is with you today. Whatever you might be facing in this life, the great I am is still with you. He's living on the inside. Come on. I want to flip over to Matthew for a second and look at this story here because Peter says, this is left out of the Mark, out of Mark and out of John, but Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come on the water. In verse 28, Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking on the water toward Jesus. But when he sees the strength of the wind, he's afraid. And he begins to sink and he calls out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand, takes hold of him, and says to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, at least Peter had a little faith. Everybody else stayed in the boat, didn't they? But Peter had a little bit of faith. He got out of the boat, but what does he do? He's looking at Jesus, the great I am. And then he's looking at the waves. Jesus and the waves. I got Jesus But those waves look pretty strong. And he starts to see the strength of the wind. See, listen, he's looking at Jesus, the word made flesh, the creator of the whole universe, the giver of life, the one who made the earth, including the wind. And what does he see? The strength of the wind. He only sees the strength of the wind. Whatever you're facing today, Maybe you're facing something today. Don't look at the strength of the thing that you're facing because that's where you get messed up. You start looking at the strength of the wind. You start looking at the strength of some sickness. You start looking at the strength of some situation, some financial thing, whatever it might be, and it looks terrifying. It looks strong. It looks overwhelming. Listen, when Israel looked at the strength of the giants, what'd they do? They realized how insignificant they were. When you look at the strength of something else, you'll always realize your own weakness. But if you'll keep your eyes on the strength of God to deliver you, if you'll keep your eyes on the, on the one who can set you free, on the one who's greater than sickness, greater than death, greater than anything, if you'll keep your eyes on him, listen, you don't have to worry about the thing that you're facing. Because the great I am is here. The mountains shake before him. Demons run and flee. At the mention of his name, the king of majesty. Come on, you know that song? There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. Listen, the great I am today is with you. 
don't be afraid. He's the one who said you'll do what he's doing, but even greater. Fear will try to keep you from stepping out. Fear will try to keep you from, from doing what he's called you to do, but don't you give fear an inch. Don't you let anything come on you and, and control you except for the spirit of God. The great I am is with you. Let me close this up. Mark chapter six, again, in verse 51, in the Amplified Bible, it says this, he went into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were astonished exceedingly beyond measure. Listen to this, verse 52, for they failed to consider or understand the teaching and meaning of the miracle of the loaves. In fact, their hearts had grown calloused, had become dull and had lost the power of understanding. They didn't understand about the loaves. They didn't understand that Jesus was the great I am. They didn't understand who Jesus really was, who was with him, who was empowering. They didn't understand that faith can change situations and, and break, break down walls and, and calm storms. They didn't understand all this. Why? Because their hearts had become dull, they'd become calloused, and they'd lost their understanding. Their hard hearts kept them in unbelief. If you, won't, if you won't have a soft heart before God, if you won't have a heart that can receive the word of God, listen, we start speaking something like this message and immediately in your, in your brain, your brain wants to answer and say, no, that won't work. That's not true. It starts to tell you because your heart's hard because you can't hear what the word of God is saying to you, that he's the one who can deliver you, that he's the one who can set you free, that he's the one who, who can make a way, that he's the great I am and he wants to be the great I am in your life, but your brain tells you something different. Why? Because your heart's hard. Their hard hearts kept them in a place of torment and toil because they couldn't understand who Jesus was. Let me ask you to stand with me today. And I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. I want to ask you this question. Do you understand who Jesus really is? Do you understand today that he's for you? Do you know that he's with you? Listen, today, maybe you're here in this place. Maybe you're watching at home this morning, this Father's Day. And you say, I've never given my heart to Jesus. Maybe your heart has been hard up to this point in your life. Maybe you've had things that have happened in your past that, has, that have given you a hard heart. Listen today, this is your chance. Let your heart become soft and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let him call you because he's calling you today. If you need to make your life right with him today, I wanna ask you right where you are, just lift your hand to the Lord this morning. Just raise your hand if you're watching at home I want you to raise your hand, not to me, but you're raising it to the Lord. And say this with me. If you want to ask Jesus into your heart, the word of God says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So say that with me. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you are the savior of the world, the great I am. Today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I ask you to come in and make me a new person today in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you just need to learn how to trust him with everything because there's been some stuff that you've been going through and you feel like you've been toiling. You feel like you've been struggling. You've been striving. You've been, you're being tortured by something. Maybe there's something that's just mentally, it's torturing you. You've been going through this thing and you just feel like you'll never get out. You'll feel like you'll never get ahead. You'll feel like you'll never get on top of it. Listen, when Jesus came walking, he came walking on top of the torment. He wants to bring you up like he did with Peter. He wants to put you on top. He came to put you on top to give you life and life more abundant. But you've got to stop the struggle. You've got to learn how to let him take over and give him complete control. If that's you this morning, right where you are, I want you to... Raise your hand. Now I'm going to pray for you if you've been going through something. And if you, need, if you need some more prayer, I want you to come down to the front. We're going to have people that will pray for you. If you've been dealing with something, if you have a whatever, something going on in your life, some situation, and you need the Lord to touch you this morning, I want you to come to the front so we can pray. But right where you are, 
We can pray for you there too. Just lift your hands to the Lord and say this, Lord, I thank you. Say that with me, Lord, I thank you that you've set me free. I thank you that you're putting me on top of the world. There's nothing that can stop me because your spirit lives in me. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So Lord, I thank you today for blessing your people. Lord, I thank you for just encouraging them. I thank you for strengthening them. Lord, I thank you that we will not be people who give in to fear and people that give in to doubt and unbelief, but Lord, we are people who live by faith. Lord, I thank you that we have faith in what you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, somebody say amen.
I have a few quick announcements for you for the rest of the month of January. Our next Men's Cornhole Fellowship Night will be January 25th at 6 p.m. We will be giving out awards to celebrate Season 5 and kick off Season 6. New participants are always welcome. Abigail Steger's baby shower has been rescheduled to January 29th at 10 a.m. in the Ed Building. If you have any questions, please see Emily Garner for more information. Our business meeting has been rescheduled to this Wednesday at 6.30. We hope to see you there. We're so excited to see what God is going to do in this new year with us. David Metz will be sharing a message with us Sunday, January 30th. We hope to see you there. Don't forget you can find all the events happening here at AFA on our church app. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Now enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah.